technology is not my forte. Um, let her rip. When does one begin to sense a kinship with those who are oppressed and persecuted? My defining moment came long before my age allowed me to understand, but it became clear in my adulthood as I began engaging in the struggle for justice and equality. On my third birthday, Nazi bombs began falling on Antwerp, Belgium, the city of my birth. I had joined the world's persecuted people. My parents, my sister and I fled across Europe to Portugal, then on to a Greek ship to the United States. I have few memories of that adventure. As Jews were slaughtered in Europe, blacks were lynched in the US. After my father's discharge from the army, I accompanied him into Manhattan to search lists for survivors of the death camps. Sadly, we did find the names of two family members who had perished at Auschwitz. I later made the connection between oppression of my people, European Jews, and my passion for opposing racism and the oppression of African Americans in my adopted country. Many whites, including clergy of all faiths, walked with Dr. King, Rabbi Lelyveld, whom I knew was beaten in Mississippi. We learned about Freedom Riders and Birmingham, saw pictures of young blacks attacked by police dogs and fire hoses. We saw black students filling Birmingham's jails as Dr. King made sure the world saw the savagery inflicted upon his people. The tragic result of a peaceful attempt to walk across the Pettus Bridge in Selma was carried in the world's newspapers and seen significantly by LBJ's staff. My hero, John Lewis, was nearly killed, brutally beaten by state troopers, and hospitalized. Here he peacefully confronts the attackers. That horrific incident led to laws guaranteeing the vote to all citizens. The Supreme Court ruled segregated schools illegal in 1954, but dilapidated schools for blacks using tattered textbooks, illegal for over a decade, were still the norm throughout the South in the 60s. Houston's racist school board enforced school segregation by building a school in every black kid's backyard. Citizens for Good Schools was organized to address this injustice by winning at the polls, and I joined up, an example of King's continuing influence. With a diverse slate of candidates, white woman Sunday school teacher, Catholic Exxon engineer, Jewish physician, black Baptist minister, we hoped to oust the racist school board majority. I co-managed the storefront headquarters of that Baptist minister, opening doors for me to the black community. Black voters were key to winning. My kids and I sat in small black churches until the pastor called me to the pulpit to help folks understand the power of their votes. Southern black Baptist ministers were strong power brokers. This woman trained parishioners to vote, then sang with them. My friend, local hero Mickey Leland, knew how to win. I drove a red convertible down streets and alleys day after day, night after night. Mickey's sitting on the back with a microphone, exhorting beautiful people of the black community, this is our destiny. For the sake of your children, please vote on Tuesday, and vote they did. More than 90% of black voters cast their ballots, tossed out the racist school board majority, and began the work of integrating schools. Mickey went on to the state legislature, to Congress, and to chair the Congressional Black Caucus. Mickey died in a 1989 plane crash, bringing food to the poor in Ethiopia, a huge loss to all people everywhere, black and white, in my memorial, shown here as published at the Texas Observer, I wrote that because he was a good guy who won, we were all winners. Dr. King, Harry Belafonte, and Aretha Franklin came to help us organize. After a meet and greet, my only conversation with King, we left for the concert. As Aretha sang, we were stink bombed. King refused to leave. His body language said, I've been beaten, stabbed, jailed, this is just a bad smell. As a black, at a black graduate school, I learned and observed absorbing King's words from the Birmingham jail, shallow understanding 
from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. King's courage and wisdom still energize our work for justice, and since 1967, his 1967 anti-war speech, for peace. He's at our shoulders as we celebrate his legacy through his words. I did so in remarks prior to this march near the Bush compound in Kennebunkport, Maine. Continuing King's work, we confronted senators demanding end to wars, bringing troops home. At Senator Snow's office, we read the declaration of peace in the street. Then in her office, quoted Dr. King on peace and justice and departed with a bit of, ins of, of assistance. King's words that I quoted at Bozeman's rally marking 10 years of war, the world stands aghast at the path we have taken. A time comes when silence is betrayal. That time has come for us. We're called to speak for the weak, for the voiceless, for victims. At Bozeman's celebration of the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington, I spoke these words from Dr. King. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. 2015 MLK Day speaker, artist, activist for justice and equality, my friend Rob Shetterly, spoke to 2,000 students, showing his portraits of Americans who tell the truth and telling of their indomitable courage. Bozeman's deputy superintendent of schools, assessing Rob's impact, told me, I believe this event changed lives. Thank you. <laughs>